story six of lanagan amateur detective by edward h hurlbut this librivox recording is in the public domain story six whatsoever a man soweth sampson city editor of the san francisco inquirer sat scowling over the times and the herald stripped blackly across the front pages of those rival morning papers was the unaccustomed seven-column lead suspect jailed for monteagle murder norton it was sampson's voice when sampson shot that curt call in his ugly voice through the swinging doors of his office i felt as though the warden was calling me from the condemned cell for the drop only the able-bodied newspaper man who has been trimmed hard by the men of the opposition papers can understand the sensation it belongs in its exquisite misery solely to such as speak the language of the tribe for the head in the inquirer my story had been only a three-column police are baffled in monteagle mystery sampson contemplated me coldly and long he fairly brooded over me but there was no outburst and that after all hurt worse than if he had put me on the irons for a broiling ralph monteagle broker millionaire well-known popular and engaged to the equally well-known and popular helen dennison had been found in his office on the fourth floor of the sutton building stabbed to death no weapon was found the door was locked the window shut neither money nor valuables were taken the knife curiously had been sliced once across each cheek evidently done after death with deliberate intent to mar the features monteagle had entered his offices at nine fifteen o'clock on monday evening the watchman had discovered the crime at midnight the system in the sutton building permitted an absolute check on all persons entering the building after eight o'clock when the outer doors were locked any person coming in after that hour was admitted by the watchman murray who until twelve o'clock was stationed in the lobby the night elevator man kept a record of each person entering the building and to which room he went it was a building given over to brokers capitalists and large law firms and several robberies of magnitude had brought about this particular system of keeping a check on all persons in the building after night the elevator man on going off duty at midnight turned his book over to the watchman who thereupon made the rounds of each of the offices where there were still tenants or visitors it was in this manner that the crime had been discovered after murray had rapped repeatedly on monteagle's door and had finally admitted himself with his master key only three other tenants had been in the building during the evening and they were able to clear themselves of all suspicion the police turned their attention to the attaches of the building suspicion fell on a janitor stromberg who had the fourth and fifth floors apparently clinching proof of the police suspicions had been afforded when stromberg's jumper blood-stained was located at his laundry it was in the arrest of stromberg which had taken place late the night before that i had been scooped through my zealousness in leaving the detectives uncovered while i followed a lead that subsequently proved entirely wrong stromberg claimed to have cut his hand with a scraper while cleaning the mosaic tiling and had a deep gash on the ball of his thumb the police theory was that he had gashed himself purposely and in answer to his defence that it would have been an insane thing for him to have sent his jumper to the laundry if he had committed the crime held to the theory that he had taken precisely that method in combination with the self-imposed gash on his hand to divert suspicion by seeming frankness with the commendable faculty of the american police in usually working to fasten the crime upon whomsoever they may happen to have in custody the officers were devoting their energies to cinching their case on stromberg when sampson had completed his disquieting survey of me he finally said i am giving this story to ransom and dixon to handle to-day i could see that he had it all figured out in his cold-blooded way that nothing else was to be expected of me than to be scooped and that any remarks would be superfluous but it ground me what i want you to do he continued nastily is to find lanagan possibly you can succeed in that at least 
i wouldn't be sorry at that if some more of you fellows drank the brand of liquor lanagan drinks once in a while i might get a story out of the bunch of you occasionally instead the times and the herald give it to us on the features of this story three days running three days it's the worst beating i've had in a year you find lanagan and tell him i want him to jump into the story independent of ransom and dixon i would like to get the tail feathers out of this thing anyhow ransom and dixon had no relish for the story three days old might as well try to galvanize a corpse grumbled ransom i turned over to them what matters i had that might bear watching and was about to leave the office when the phone rang for me very fortunately it was lanagan and i couldn't forbear a sort of gulp because i felt instinctively that he had wakened up somewhere out of his ten days lapse with the knowledge that i was handling the monteagle story and was getting badly beaten on it i was right in that too thought i would catch you before you left he said his voice was throaty and i judged that he had been seeing some hard days and nights suppose that uh, pickled jellyfish of a samson has been lacing you you should be laced met brady a few minutes ago and he said you were handling or mishandling the story you ought to get a month's layoff for letting that crowd of two by four dubs on the times at least get the best of you come on down i want to talk things over he was at billy connor's buckets of blood that famed bar-room rendezvous by the hall of justice where the thieves clans were wont to foregather there was nothing of particular coincidence in his ringing me up just when he did it was shortly after one o'clock the hour when the local staff reported on and he would be sure of finding me in he sat at the rear alcove table with king monahan you know my friend the king of course was his greeting monahan one time designated king of the pickpockets after serving two terms had retired from the active practice of that profession to establish himself it was generally believed not only as a fence handling exclusively the precious stones but also as a sort of local organizer to whom any outside gang must report on or before beginning any operation in san francisco there is a system in crime these days as in all things else kind of stuck it in and broke it off didn't they he continued i've stood one panning from samson i don't want another from you i retorted savagely nori he said you overlooked a very vital point the king and i have been talking it over he had the three morning papers spread out before him and we have concluded that there was a woman in the case and when two eminent criminologists like kid monahan and jack lanagan agree that there is a woman in a case it at least is worthy of consideration a mall sure vouchsafed monahan in his diffident way he had a manner as timorous as a girl which possibly accounted for the success that he enjoyed while practising his profession he was not one on the crowded platform of a trolley car who would be immediately suspected when some proletarian raised a cry of sneak thief and sought in vain for a stick pin watch or wallet stromberg may or may not be guilty said lanagan but i don't think much of the case the police have made against him it at least doesn't bar us from another line of speculation tell me for instance why in the name of the seven sons didn't some of you sleuths go off on the theory that whoever committed that crime got into the office earlier in the evening and remained concealed in the closet until monteagle came in it would have been the easiest thing in the world to have decoyed monteagle to his office even if it wasn't known that he was working nights to make up for the lunches and bachelor dinners and afternoon teas that he's been going to on account of his coming marriage and as for whoever committed the murder getting out you have been on the scene in too many murders not to know the hysteria that comes over a bunch of yaps like that it's a safe bet they all ran for a regular policeman and that whoever was in that room provided he was still there or she when the crime was discovered could have walked out of that building with a fairway as wide as market street murray ran for a policeman i admitted and some of the janitors with him that's what special cops usually do was lanagan's comment and it's a safe bet that those square-head janitors all ran with him they didn't stay around those corridors alone after that crime was discovered until a regular copper came along i've seen the thing happen and so has every police reporter in the business 
lanagan paused pushed back a half-drained suisses and called for a sweet soda his curious habit when breaking off a lapse whoever killed monteagle he continued was in that room when he entered always assuming of course that it was not stromberg now i have something additional through the king and his invaluable sources of information on men and affairs it is this monteagle is known to certain portions of the night life he was a two-faced society blatherskite with a broad streak of primal vulgarity who drank tea in swagger drawing-rooms with his fiancée and her friends in the afternoon and champagne with an entirely different social set after midnight you know the kind was rather keen about women in an underhanded quiet way it is not difficult for a man of his means to do a lot of things behind the unassailable french restaurant walls and get by with it you recall the knife was drawn neatly across both cheeks i see you indulged in a theory that he possibly was the victim of some blackmail brotherhood you even hinted at the mafia i am surprised at you you ought to let that exaggerated institution rest for a while i have a little theory of my own on that knifing business which i think we will now work upon phone samson when you get a chance that it pleases lanagan to go to work for his sweatshop wages again we parted company with monahan after he had promised lanagan to drift through his particular world or that portion of it which was up then and endeavour to learn something of the identity of any of monteagle's affiliations under the rose we headed for the sutton building and in the lobby found murray just coming on duty do you think any one could have gotten out of that room in the excitement after you found the body asked lanagan no sir said murray with aged preciseness i locked the door on the outside when i went for an officer and it could not have been opened because in my hurry i left my master's key turned in the lock when i went for a policeman so much for lanagan's a very plausible theory of the getaway he came up from it as suave as ever and asked could any one have been in that room before monteagle came in do you suppose no sir said murray with the didacticism of the aged again no sir there was nobody in that room i know because the elevator boy denny heard the telephone bell ringing for eight or ten times and finally let himself in and answered it but the party hung up mr monteagle was very free and easy with us men which accounts for denny taking the liberty there was nobody in that room when denny was in there and that was well after eight o'clock after i came on duty it all gets me sir how that knife sticker got into that room or how he got out after he got there i don't like to think old stromberg had a hand in it but it looks a leetle black for ole according to the papers i know my skirts are clear we went on up to the room the public administrator with monteagle's lawyer and his stenographer was there the lawyer was inclined to get forward but the administrator was a good programmer for a newspaper man and smoothed matters over lanagan was studying the stenographer intelligent of feature stylishly but plainly dressed and bearing about her eyes and mouth very plain indications of the nervous tension under which she must have laboured during the last three days she was one of that type of well-poised secretary stenographers found in most large offices lanagan made an opportunity of asking her did mr monteagle have any enemies that you know of persons who have threatened him personally by letter or over the phone none that i know of she replied quietly do you think asked lanagan quickly eyeing the girl narrowly with those singularly penetrating eyes of his do you think it could have been possible that a person might have been concealed in that closet when you locked the office door for the night oh no no she answered quickly but her eyes involuntarily swept first to the closet and then to lanagan's face as though in secret anxious questioning why it makes me shiver even to think such a thing could have happened she added and she unmistakably shivered a little there was more conversation and lanagan fell to examining the room he first examined the closet then he opened the window and scrutinized the sill for a long time he got down on his knees and peered beneath the heat radiator of coiled pipes he lit a match the space between the bottom of the radiator and the floor being so slight that he could not examine it as closely as he seemed to want to 
expect your man to get into the room through that asked the public administrator with heavy facetiousness oh no replied lanagan smoothly it's just possible he got out of the room through it though and continued with his minute examination the stenographer grace northrup by name although assisting the other two sorting out papers found time each moment to flash a quick glance at lanagan whether it was merely active feminine curiosity i could not determine as for me i had been over the room half a dozen times already it held nothing further for me but i never could even guess at the clues lanagan might turn up on a trail that a dozen men had tramped over so i remained to see him work with keen interest when lanagan had finished we left now norrie my boy to the bush street office of the telephone company he said with as much enthusiasm as i ever saw him exhibit you are a fine old blunderbuss for fair but the others aren't any better plain as the nose on your face lord lord he stopped and looked at me laughing immoderately i was inclined to be a trifle sulky he made me feel like a six-dollar cub only he continued it's a three days trail that i have taken up and that dirk wielder has got just that much of a start always assuming for the sake of the argument that it was not stromberg i didn't ask him what he was going to the telephone office for it came to me with a sting that i had heard that same bit of information about the telephoning dropped during the last two or three days and in the press of clues that i considered more important had dismissed it which was the difference between jack lanagan and the rest of us he had that intuitive faculty of eliminating the superfluous and driving at the main fact it is after all a faculty found in all successful men of whatever occupation we both knew lamb traffic manager of the phone company lanagan asked for permission to talk with the girl who on monday night handled the board having bush twelve forty three monteagle's number lamb was a substantial chap and promised to keep our visit in confidence it was just before four o'clock and the four to ten shift of girls was coming on in a few moments a young girl of sensible pleasant demeanour was shown to the room and lamb retired after requesting that she give us all the information she might have on whatever subjects we discussed you will be performing a service that will be appreciated said lanagan if you could recall whether on monday evening along about eight o'clock you had several calls for bush twelve forty three yes sir i do she instantly answered it was not a busy night and i was handling three positions the call came from the east office we do not talk to the party direct on an outside call an east supervisor came on the line several times to instruct me to try and raise the number that is how i recall it so distinctly i may tell you that that is the telephone number of the office of mr monteagle who was murdered said lanagan i don't suppose you ever got a line on whom his telephone calls might be from as a general thing did you no sir she answered primly i pay no attention to whom is on the line thank you said lanagan i think you can be trusted not to say anything about our visit or questions yes sir she said we got a card of introduction from lamb to adams manager of east office and hurried there wasn't that rather an indiscreet thing to do tell her monteagle's number i suggested lanagan laughed and slapped me on the back it was evident he was in high feather with himself i was trundling along absolutely in the dark my dear norrie when you meet a girl like that take her into your confidence did you get that to whom she smelt a rat and would have looked the number up and blown the glad tidings all over the office that a couple of detectives or newspaper men had been interviewing her on the murder recollect too that the telephone from the reporter's room at police headquarters comes in on this exchange it's just possible that some of those gay young blades on night police have affiliations with some of these gay young blondes i have got many a story through phone girls and have occasionally lost a story through the same medium got me as it stands she is all puffed up with her own importance and pat with us there are times when you've got to take a chance at spilling your hand this was one of them i subsided humbled 
not to occupy too much space with the merely routine details of working out the clue we met adams another substantial chap the chief operator recalled distinctly the number more particularly because the woman calling it had been nervous and irritable the call came she said from the public booth at shoemate's pharmacy it was only a couple of blocks away and we went there it was a large establishment with half a dozen clerks we worked down the list the fourth man had been on duty monday night and recalled a young woman who had entered the booth repeatedly on that evening she lived some place in the vicinity he said and usually got off the sutter street car shortly after five thirty o'clock the car stopped directly in front of the door and if we would wait he would point her out to us if she came that way this evening i took a position outside to signal in when a car approached and lanagan remained inside it was then just after five among the passengers from one car i noticed miss northrup and was about to step forward and speak to her on a chance of her dropping something additional when i caught a glimpse out of the tail of my eye of lanagan signalling me with a swift gesture i dodged around the corner before she saw me she passed on up sutter street and in a few moments lanagan picked me up his sallow face taking on a tinge of colour and his dark eyes sparkling pretty near scrambled the eggs that time didn't you he chuckled that's the woman who did the telephoning i stared do you recall that furtive look with which she followed me at the office she lives just up there where we will let her rest for a time with her troubles and i fancy she has them let us go back to connor's i am to meet monahan there the king was waiting for us he took lanagan to one side all i could hear was lanagan's good once and then the king had slipped out the side door best single asset the police have is monahan said lanagan apropos of nothing in particular knows more about the night life of this city than any four men in it but he tips nothing that might hurt his own game or his own people in a way he preserves a certain code even while acting as a police stool in this matter however the invaluable mr monahan is working for jack lanagan and the police are consequently about three steps behind i see nothing in sight for some hours we will eat our dinner and take in a show for a few moments i rather anticipate a climax later and some rapid-fire work for us both on the typewriter i need a little stimulus that hasn't got wormwood in it he would give me absolutely not a line on his lay he could be a baffling enigmatic impersonal proposition when he took the humour we headed for the oyster loaf and i groaned for the four and a half that was between me and payday as lanagan methodically disposed of an onion soup special french mushrooms on toast a new york cut gorgonzola and a two-bit cigar he drank three glasses of ice water but that didn't cost anything a man's meal he said with vast creature content now give me that other half you have left i want a shave you go up and touch dan for a five spot we may need expenses later i'll meet you at dan's at nine o'clock i want to pick monahan up again before i see you and also see leslie at the time appointed we met let's take a ten twenty thirty suggested lanagan by half past ten we will have to get busy there's a singer over at the continental that some of the dramatic critics say has real fire la patini i think she is called so we drifted into the continental and caught part of the performance there were trained birds of more than ordinary sagacity the stereotyped and fearful cornet soloist the girl singer la patini with a wonderful mezzo a remarkable beauty an undoubted future and an ability to sing the rosary in a manner to bring tears then came a slapstick tumbling act that was impossible and we left lanagan had suddenly become thoughtful do you know what i think he said i think the world would actually do better to sweep away every vestige of law and ordinance and make a clean start again our system of punishment is all wrong take one heinous class of crimes we punish the individual who takes upon herself to punish we say the state has the power of punishment and the prerogative and yet in the very crimes that are the most damnable the state can never interfere because the injured party must suffer in silence 
you might as well expect children to learn english through hieroglyphics as to make applicable to present-day conditions the antiquated penal code to which society is harnessed that's about enough of the sermon stuff it's not in my line lanagan was taking the lead but i was not altogether surprised when we finally found ourselves in the neighbourhood of the northrop home nor was i altogether surprised when chief leslie that shrewd and a veteran thief-taker suddenly stepped from a doorway my mind shot ahead to the northrop home a few doors away and i could not bring myself to believe it could be possible that she was a principal brady is above said leslie he says she came in about twenty minutes ago we'd better move on her immediately said lanagan and in a moment more we were all three before the door to a lower flat of the old-fashioned sort with a bell jangling noisily as lanagan pulled out the handle it was miss northrup who answered the ring she had on a dressing-gown and her hair i could see had been taken down for retiring and then gathered in a loose coil on her head probably when the bell rang she opened the door but a few inches we would like to speak with you a moment miss northrup said lanagan he indicated the chief this is chief leslie kindly permit us to enter said the chief there was a shadow of authority in his tone and i knew that lanagan and the chief were planning a drive on the girl and that something would be stirring in this old-fashioned flat before long she hesitated a moment and then threw the door wide open and motioned us into the parlour in the hall a gas jet burned dimly as though for some member of the family who was not yet home she reached up and turned on the parlour light and as she did so her loosely coiled hair tumbled about her shoulders as the light struck down upon her features they had an appearance almost tragic be seated she said it needed no expert eye to detect in her drawn lips the evidence of nervous tension madam said leslie abruptly snapping his jaws like a trap and i knew this twenty-year-old girl was in for the third degree unless you at this time make a clean breast of all that you know concerning the murder of your employer ralph monteagle it will be necessary for me to book you for murder as an accessory before the fact she started violently her bosom began to rise and fall quickly it was evident a breakdown was imminent but she managed to say with considerable smoothness i know nothing more than i have already told the police and the reporters lanagan fierce eagerness glittering in his eyes stepped before her nevertheless possibly you know he said biting each word off short how many persons beside yourself and bartlett monteagle's former chauffeur who bought it knew of the rope in his closet knew that monteagle had a morbid fear of being trapped in that building at night by fire that he had had that fear since his friend mervyn was burned to death in the baldwin hotel fire and that he let no one know about the rope for fear of being ridiculed how many persons i say besides yourself and bartlett knew the rope was there and when you knew that that rope had disappeared as you must have known it why didn't you tell the police why did you permit a man to lie in prison whom you in your heart feel is innocent she sprang to her feet and threw both hands towards him as though warding off physical blows she was trembling in intense agitation don't don't oh for god's sake don't she sank back again into her chair her face buried in her hands rocking and moaning with lanagan standing over her inexorable as nemesis there was the sound of quick light running up the front stairs a key was turned in the lock and the front door swung open and the girl in the chair startled from her huddled misery sprang to her feet and fairly leaped to meet the newcomer she cried out but whether in warning or in the joy of greeting could not be said for her voice was half smothered in a sob sister she said at last falteringly sister please go to your room it is only some more policeman about mr monteagle the words came chokingly the other had not as yet come into our sight but now she stepped into the light that streamed from the parlour into the hall and i heard lanagan's swift involuntary ejaculation la patini her sister 
leslie swift as thought was half across the parlor floor to the hall yielding to a natural police impulse but the newcomer the other girl clinging to her stepped fully into the doorway to the parlor yes she said in a voice that had no tremor of emotion la patini her sister why why said leslie grimly because we were just going to book her for murder as an accessory before the fact we will switch the cut now and book you as the principal at the feet of the queenly patini the harassed sisters swooned lanagan pulled shut the door leading to the hall so that no one might by any mischance disturb us and i fell to chafing the wrists of the senseless girl la patini sank wearily to a chair stooping so that she could stroke her sister's temples i am glad it is over she said apathetically i have only wondered that it did not come sooner i have expected it hourly the story was soon told simple age-old but ever new sordid possibly to a slight degree but profoundly sad she who was now known as la patini met monteagle while visiting her sister at his office he had found means to extend the acquaintance had aided her in a secret way in her ambitions for the stage securing the engagement at the continental for her and as a result of the clandestine relation there had been a promise of marriage then had come the engagement announcement of the denison monteagle marriage and the awakening of the dupe but this was not the dupe of monteagle's many experiences the picture of miss dennison staring at her from the society columns had fired a sinister jealousy a confession had been made to the younger sister when la patini sought an opportunity of pleading once again alone with monteagle who had finally repudiated her the sister had admitted her to the office after monteagle left for the afternoon knowing he was to return in the evening she concealed herself in the closet before she entered the office her plan had been formed either monteagle would marry her or he would die at that time she had no thought of escaping she had heard the telephone ringing repeatedly heard the elevator boy enter the room just too late to get the party calling finally monteagle had arrived and she had discovered herself what happened was quickly over the quarrel was a few words and he had struck her with his fist she stabbed him to the heart and then with a vindictiveness that she could not now understand and shuddered at recalling had marred his features with the knife her first thought had been to give herself up then she wondered why she should do that the brief words of their quarrel had not been heard the janitor she could hear on the floor above after all she had done no more than kill a snake the thought of the rope came to her she knew about it because once when she was in the office as monteagle worked late she had expressed anxiety at being seen coming from the building with him and he had showed her the rope and jokingly offered to let her down from the window which opened upon a divisional alley in the rear of the sutton building the rope was of great length seeking for a place to tie it she naturally turned to the radiator the thought occurred to her with a flash her means of escape from the room might never be known if the rope was long enough to run under the radiator letting both ends to the ground she could then draw it down after she reached the ground by pulling on one end and letting it run under the radiator like a pulley she tried the length the light from the windows of the elevator shaft opening into the area way giving sufficient brightness as part of the preparation for the future on the stage that mr monteagle was to help me get she said dispassionately i have taken gymnasium work to build up my system you can see it was no extraordinary thing for me to let myself down by the double rope pulling the window shut after i climbed out i left it open enough so that the rope could run free when i pulled it after me i threw the rope in a street garbage tin i was at the theatre remarkable as it may seem in time for my act at ten o'clock although i missed the first show i have been in a daze since i was in a trance after i did the stabbing i have known i must be found out i am glad that it is all over i have made no attempt to escape i am absolutely indifferent to my fate the sister recovered from her swoon was weeping softly her head bowed on the other's lap tell me said lanagan curiously to her why did you telephone to monteagle 
she gasped and it appeared for the moment that she was about to swoon again finally she faltered while her own sister looked at her strangely i was afraid sister meant him harm i didn't think of it until i, I got home then something about her face came back to me i wanted to warn mr monteagle not to arouse her i finally succeeded in getting him at his club before he left for his office and he only laughed yes said la Pettini bitterly he told me so and laughed and snapped his fingers when he spoke about you that was just before he struck me and then i killed him the sudden fresh sobs of the younger girl smothered as they were in her sister's lap seemed to wrench her very being lanagan glanced at leslie leslie averted his eyes there was a prolonged pause broken only by the agonized stifled sobbing while she of crime threw her arms shelteringly around the weaker vessel but her own deathly calm she preserved finally leslie rose slowly and said simply i am sorry i have no recourse my duty is clear so is mine said lanagan quickly and it is this i will guarantee you miss northrup the support of the inquirer and i will secure for you as counsel my personal friend mr william haddon the ablest man in the west to present your case to a jury in the proper manner to secure the acquittal that you are entitled to it was then after one o'clock we left leslie at the house to bring the girl to the city prison after she had an opportunity of parting from her family leslie was to contrive not to book her before half-past two to save our exclusive by that time the times and the herald would be gone to press on our hurried trip to the office where i took vast delight marching in on sampson with a grin lanagan supplied me with the missing links he spoke of finding a few strands from a manila rope sticking beneath the radiator and of his instant surmise as to the precise way in which the escape had been made monahan located bartlett monteagle's former chauffeur who had taken a public stand and from him learned of the rope that monteagle had in his closet which bartlett had bought lanagan knew from his careful search that the rope was not in the closet when he made his examination and he promptly concluded that miss grace northrup must have known who committed the crime she knew the rope was there according to bartlett and lanagan rightly surmised that she must have known of its disappearance robbery not having been the motive lanagan had rapped to the theory of a jealous or vengeful woman who had deliberately marred the features after death his police experience had included a case or two where somewhat similar conditions had been present it was from bartlett that the first tip came on la Patini, although he did not know and neither did lanagan at that time that she was the sister of monteagle's stenographer all he knew was that until he left monteagle's employ she seemed to be the favoured of the alliances that the broker secretly maintained lanagan had discovered that la Patini had missed her first show on monday night and the circumstance was sufficient to stir his suspicions although it must be confessed that until the development at the home where her relationship to miss northrup was disclosed nothing positive had been secured against her the moment the relationship was made clear both lanagan and the chief had instantly reached the same conclusion the drive had been made and the confession followed great jack great said sampson with as much enthusiasm as his thin blood could support gad what a wailing we gave em what a wailing the inquirer had smeared the story over three pages breaking all make-up rules on type display it was a clean exclusive in every detail well sampson replied lanagan it isn't much to be proud of at that only it's all in our game but i've given my promise and we've got to get that girl acquitted well that's up to you said sampson the paper's yours end of story six story seven of lanagan amateur detective by edward h hurlbut this librivox recording is in the public domain story seven the pendleton legacy i have always considered bannerman said jack lanagan deliberately the crookedest judge that ever sat on the bench in san francisco 
attorney haddon distinguished in criminal practice thumped his office table exactly he said have felt that way about it myself but he seems to have a hold on the people and he makes capital out of the fact that he ever permits a shyster lawyer to practice in his court simple replied lanagan he doesn't have to he does business with fogarty direct they take dinner two or three times a week at the st germain other times they use the telephone those are things people don't know there aren't many who do outside of myself but at that i suppose he might get by with the long-eared public with the explanation that billy fogarty bail bond grafter and a chief of the shysters was a schoolmate of his raised on the same street and a member of one or two fraternal organizations with him all of which is true bannerman he continued doesn't bother with small cases he's after the big stuff and i have a hunch that somewhere back of this case there is big graft he has been against us from the start and by the lord harry lanagan had arisen his black eyes snapping i've put several men in jail but here's one that i'm going to get out peters no more murdered that little child of his than i did it's an absolute obsession with me that there is some colossal mystery back of the whole thing some gigantic conspiracy and bannerman's attitude to-day gives me the first direct line to work on i have had i'm going to work on it again at once charles peters a machinist twenty-five years of age had been held to answer by bannerman that day to the higher court on a charge of murder for slaying his weak old son it was a case that had attracted wide attention when several organizations of women's club took a stand against peters he had married as was brought out at the preliminary hearing a woman of the night life who had made him to all report a capable wife originally from oakland after the marriage he had moved to an isolated little home on the outskirts of the potrero where neither he nor his wife were known before their child was born they had been overheard by a passing neighbor in a violent quarrel peters freely admitted the quarrel but explained that on the particular night in question he had been overwrought with a particularly hard day's labor returned home wearied and worried to find a statement from the doctor for a large amount and for a moment had become resentful at having another mouth to feed with nothing but debt before him the quarrel he said was quickly made up and the relations of the two were happy up to and after the child was born but the prosecuting attorney had made great use of the evidence bannerman ruling consistently against the objections of haddon the dead child had been found by a crone who was ministering to mrs peters she had placed it in a cot in a room adjacent to the mother's room and had left both mother and child asleep at about six thirty o'clock while she went out to attend to some small purchases she returned at about a quarter to seven to find peters just home from his work and sitting by his wife's bed she was asleep it was not for some little time later that the beldame going to the child's cot discovered that it was dead her first suppressed cry had been heard by the acute ears of the mother even in sleep and she awakened from slumber to call for her babe in the excitement that followed with the husband and the beldame she became alarmed and rising made her way to the adjoining room to discover the dreadful truth she sank rapidly after the shock and died within a few days it was not until the doctor coming on a call to attend the mother examined the child that the marks of strangulation were discovered on its little throat the police were promptly notified after one nice detention the old woman was freed of suspicion and the police hand fell on peters he protested that he had entered the house not fifteen minutes before the old woman had found both mother and babe asleep as he supposed and had sat down by his wife's side to watch until the nurse returned such were the principal facts lanagan working from a stubborn conviction of peter's innocence had devoted much attention to the case finally when the police brought peters to trial lanagan had enlisted the services of haddon to defend him lanagan had known haddon for a good many years known him when he was a young prosecutor in the police courts he had given him many friendly boosts in those days 
haddon had never forgotten he was frank to admit that it was the newspaper men at police headquarters constantly featuring him in the police news who gave him his real start after bannerman had ruled as a committing magistrate binding peters over to trial for murder lanagan had walked to haddon's office reviewing the events of the day it was his own conviction as well as that of haddon that in all fairness from the evidence presented bannerman should have dismissed the charge that he should have held peters as guilty gave lanagan a freshened enthusiasm in peters behalf because it appeared to lanagan that bannerman was acting under powerful pressure in finding such a holding even with the sentiment created by neurotic women in favour of a conviction i'll keep you posted on developments said lanagan as he left haddon's office cheerfully helping himself to a fistful of the cigars which that discriminating smoker imported for his own use i may need your service later samson he said to his city editor a few moments later there's something funny about that peters case in spite of their holding him to answer haddon thinks as i do i'm going to tackle it again tear into it jack said samson you haven't turned much up lately anyhow think you're going stale oh, we'll see said lanagan briefly the st germain in the days before the fire had a public entrance on stockton street and a private entrance on o'farrell directly across from the private entrance was a cigar stand and there lanagan loitered for an hour or more if i'm right in this thing he said bannerman and fogarty will be getting together to talk over the situation and if they do i'll let them know pretty pronto that we suspect a nigger in the woodpile somewhere and see if i can't start them to covering up in a fashion that i can follow it was about dusk when he suddenly crossed the street and went in at the private door fogarty had entered a few minutes before lanagan did not worry about bannerman he would take the front door with his high silk hat and his frock coat and his exaggerated impeccability that old french restaurant had turned up more than one good story in its day and the upper floor steward was one of lanagan's numerous leaks in the nightlife district a dollar to the steward and he had been told the number of the room where bannerman was dining he knocked at the door as the waiter might gently it was fogarty who half opened it lanagan caught a glimpse of bannerman who passed the plate in the church on sundays with a dry martini nicely poised at his lips a champagne cooler stood comfortably by fogarty for a moment seemed about to close the door but was quick-witted enough not to do so want me jack he asked suavely he was of the full-fed type of saloon man a sort of near broker in appearance come on in and join us thanks said lanagan shortly just ate i was curious to see who bannerman was dining with that's all the dry martini struck the table suddenly and slopped over what a miserable weak sister of a crook thought lanagan i can admire a big crook but this breed why my dear mr lanagan exclaimed bannerman coming forward so hastily his napkin trailed behind him from his collar where it had been tucked i've just met my old friend william quite accidentally we went to school together you know i seldom see him nowadays to hear the notorious billy fogarty called william made lanagan smile fogarty himself had difficulty repressing his grin judge said lanagan smoothly you lie don't try to peddle any of that stuff on me you see him about three times a week right here in this room and you regulate your court calendar by what he tells you i had very particular reasons for wondering whether you were here tonight. i see you are so long billy enjoy that wine judge but you better order another martini before either could make reply he backed away from the door and left the cafe pretty fair start he muttered to himself grimly a judge with bannerman's appreciation of newspapers will have a lively understanding of the mess i caught him in if there is anything wrong here there will be a get-together of some sort quick his thoughts swung back to the case in hand the man who was big enough to take that woman away from the night-life and make her his wife was not the man who was killing their child he repeated to himself with stubborn reiteration 
and yet there could not be found hitherto the slightest shard of motive on the part of any one else to account for the killing and yet so far as lanagan's investigations had gone in the case peter's record was found to be ordinary enough and neither in his life nor that of his family was there anything irregular to be discovered that would create the barest suspicion of any person seeking to strike at him through the child there could be found not the slightest shard of motive on the part of any one else to account for the killing the life of the wife began with the meeting with peters what her heritage was or her history before that time proved a problem absolutely insoluble to lanagan and the police although the police for their part did little save work to fasten the crime on the husband even the brilliant leslie greatest chief of his time taking that line the records of the night life are unwritten save where the requiescat is inscribed when a callous deputy coroner blots the entry at the morgue who she was before she came into the brooding shadow of the night lights was a secret that if any of the wastrels there knew they guarded it it is more than likely that they did not know it is a great wide way the entrance there she had come by that way one of a multitude into the shadows and out whether she went out for happiness or ill whether to a free life or a sombre death few there cared to ask even if they recalled her at all ceaselessly lanagan had searched that district he could trace her back to the time when peters met her and no further that incident had made some trifling stir merely because the guy who got copped on gracie had taken her away and really married her or so they had heard otherwise she had come into that tenderloin district as many of her transitory sisters with a suitcase but whether from far or near no one could say the influences that were eager to land peters in the penitentiary were unquestionably the same that murdered the child so lanagan argued under the spell of his new theory they had not slain the mother directly but they may have shrewdly calculated the effect upon her in her precarious condition of the death of the child knowledge of which could scarcely be kept from her let us suppose then mused lanagan let us suppose that someone wanted the child out of the way and now wants the husband out of the way it would be possible to hang him for that crime in the present state of the public mind and with bannerman holding him to answer for murder life is the least he will get what happens the child of gracie dubois is dead the husband is or soon will be civilly dead she is dead but that does not appear to have a moving cause why the child's death and the father's imprisonment undoubtedly so that someone may profit but who who concealed back of the shadows of the night lights kept grim watch on gracie dubois who was concerned with the fate of that poor wretched girl anxious only for redemption for a decent life what dead hand is it that has slain her issue and blighted her poor hopes for happiness and her passionate ambition for motherhood and bannerman with his high silk hat and his frock coat and his impeccable respectability came before him insistently bannerman with his dry martini and his quart of wine and his vis-a-vis -vis dinner with william fogarty many thoughts that apparently flash into the mind spontaneously are but the products of a chain of thought carried consistently over a period of time it was so with lanagan and his sudden theory of the dead hand of a case that in some manner reverted back to a will or to an inheritance he was rather surprised that the thought had not occurred sooner but he had been busied with other thoughts and theories and it was not until the way had been cleared that in its logical time that theory had suddenly struck him with conviction and obviously it was the only theory that had not as yet been exploited by him that some time back in the earlier life of that poor waif of the night life there might lie the solution of the crime financial reasons for desiring to be rid of her progeny and her natural legatee her husband the question intruded why was not the husband murdered as well 
there might be many reasons but one would answer his imprisonment would suffice even if he were not executed and if he managed to avoid any penalty there would be time enough to see him and leading back to that dead hand theory of his lanagan could see but two links bannerman and fogarty from the neighbourhood of the st germain he got me on the wire cover fogarty's he said pick up some of the bunch and drop in casually keep your eye on him if he's there and who he talks to spend some money and get soberly drunk if necessary to allay any suspicion that he is being watched get samson on the phone by ten o'clock there may be a message for you i hadn't the faintest idea what it was all about but lanagan's voice was as snappy as a drill master i went to the reporter's room at police headquarters and led a bunch to fogarty's to rattle the dice for a round or two it was pay night and money was free if fogarty after he came in had any suspicions of me he knew that lanagan and i always worked together they were soon allayed the dice rolled blithely for an hour or two with one of the boys dropping out occasionally to cover the police beat for the others while the play went on but nothing happened and i slipped away to get samson on the phone it was ten o'clock he was didactic as usual and as irritatingly brief report to lanagan room eight o two fairmont take the back stairs and make the room above all things without being seen that same old tingle that always shot up my spine when lanagan was calling me in on the smash of one of his grand climaxes shivered up to my hair roots in a general way i knew the quest he was on but that his search should have led him to the fairmont hotel on the very crest of aristocratic knob hill was sufficient without further information to set my imagination humming the door was open and i entered noiselessly lanagan was lying on the bed smoking he jumped up here he said quickly indicating a chair drawn up before the door leading to the adjoining room they were sweet rooms but used separately sit there until i get back and take notes on what you hear keep your ear glued to that hole he had cut with his pocket-knife an inch hole in the panelling of the door he had whittled it so nicely that it was not quite cut entirely through you will find you can hear everything that is said in an ordinary tone of voice there's no one in there now an englishman named holmes has the room pretty soon i expect him and larry leighton in there with a girl i am going out and get hold of leslie lock the door after me and keep your ears open for us when we get back i won't knock but will turn the handle once or twice what's the lay i asked no time to talk now he flung back over his shoulder and was gone it was probably twenty minutes later when the occupants of the adjoining room entered there were two men and a woman i could distinguish perfectly leighton's sonorous voice he had been a lawyer of standing in years gone by but lately had been involved in one or two transactions a trifle shady in character chiefly pertaining to the administration of estates but nothing had ever been proved against him nor had the matter ever got into such shape that the papers could use it so far as the general public was concerned he stood well enough i felt i could not be wrong leighton was saying and i am glad that you are satisfied it must be a source of great satisfaction to you miss pendleton to be restored to your name and inheritance i am only sorry now it did not happen before poor father went the girl replied with a tremble in her voice and i fancied she was crying personally it was the englishman's voice i am satisfied of the identity but of course my principals in london will also have to be satisfied it would be best to leave at once i think for england for the sake of the pendleton name we must work secretly and quietly i would not want the matter in the public prints for the world i was listening with such intentness that it was some time before the soft and insistent grating of the door-knob caught my attention 
i tiptoed to the door lanagan entered in another moment leslie came in and after a few moments of interval brady and wilson two of leslie's steadiest thief-takers stepped in softly there was big game afoot of some sort leslie had his ear to the door he remained there for some time and then motioned brady who took his turn followed by wilson lanagan was sitting on a corner of the little table swinging his feet lazily but following every move made by the officers and watching every shade of expression in their faces leslie took another turn and a half smile played over lanagan's face as that veteran chief finally stepped over to him and put out his hand lanagan gripped it not a word was spoken motioning to brady and wilson leslie stepped out and we followed he rapped on the door to the adjoining room leighton opened it a look of inquiry on his rotund features as swiftly as though a swab had been rubbed over it his look of inquiry shaded into one of alarm as he recognized leslie we filed in and wilson snapped the lock behind him and stood at the door brady walking quickly to the window and taking his position there not a word had as yet been spoken leighton stood as though stupefied the englishman a dapper well-dressed man of probably forty smoking a cigarette at ease raised his brows as we entered but said nothing on the edge of the bed the girl was sitting her wide eyes following leslie it was evident that she knew him by sight her resemblance to mrs peters was striking both were women of that blonde doll-faced type so frequently found in the night life leighton said leslie the jig is up leighton sank into a chair the chief went to the connecting door tapped for a moment and then jabbed his knife through lanagan's ear-hole see he said laconically we've been listening there for thirty minutes gertrude pendleton is dead you know she is dead and her child with her and this woman here turning sharply to the girl knows that she is not gertrude pendleton she knows perfectly well that she is playing a crooked lost air case for you leighton as though he had been a jack-in-the-box holmes jumped to his feet heaven sir he cried why what are you saying who are you leslie threw back his coat displaying his diamond-studded shield chief of police leslie of san francisco he said shortly with a swift movement the girl's hand went to her corsage and in a flash lanagan had hurtled across the room and a tiny dagger spun to the floor she threw herself back upon the bed crying in sudden hysteria you might have let me done it you might have let me done it she wailed bitterly lanagan was wrapping up his hand he had got the point of the dagger through the ball of his thumb in the rush she jumped up again and threw herself at the feet of leslie it's my first crooked trick so help me chief he dragged me into it what was i to do it looked easy and it was a way out of the tenderloin leighton was glancing heavily his lips apart from the door to the window as though planning an attempt to escape by either means you've been shading pretty close on one or two things lately leighton said the chief grimly but i didn't think you had it in you to take a chance at the scaffold what do you mean by that chief gasped leighton with a sickly attempt at composure he means thundered lanagan that you are the man back of the murder of the real gertrude pendleton's child and the indirect killing of gertrude pendleton who was mrs peters he means that you are the man back of fogarty who is the man who secured the conviction in bannerman's court of peters that's what he means lanagan wheeled on the englishman how much money have you already paid leighton one thousand pounds for producing this girl he was to get four thousand more when final proof of identity was accepted by my principals in london leslie and lanagan exchanged glances it was big pickings for larry leighton twenty five thousand dollars in all properly handled by fogarty it would go a long way to grease the wheels of justice in the police court leighton arose shaking like a palsied man and tottered rather than walked to the chief he extended his wrists 
put on the bracelets chief he said in a voice that was but a shadow of his rich voice i took my chances i'll take my medicine the girl hasn't done anything yet you can hold her on she knows nothing about the other thing the doctors had given me two years to live kidneys gone and i saw a chance for a big clean-up and the german springs it might have saved me big interrupted the englishman awed one hundred and fifty thousand pounds that's all chief resumed leighton i did the trick with a child myself i wouldn't trust anybody else the night was pitch black and there are no houses right near there you know i waited till the old lady went out after i finished the child i was going to get the mother but the front gate slammed it was peters coming home i slipped out the back door again i wanted the husband out of the way on general principles i did not know what his wife might have told him and he was better off in case any publicity attended the restoration of the girl here where he couldn't squeak in case his wife had ever told him her real name and story this girl here a tenderloiner that i picked up because she looks a good bit like mrs peters seems to have nerve enough for the deal and she was to collect the estate and give me half it was a big gamble you're right about the scaffold chief i never took any such chance before but this was a getaway stake for life for me and i took it i had no direct dealings with bannerman there's nothing on him i had talks with fogarty but paid no money in a general way he gathered i wanted the man across and i guess he gathered too that there would be a big clean-up all around at the end of it there's no case on anybody except myself nothing on bannerman or fogarty that would make a case in court possibly said lanagan curtly but plenty that the inquirer can print you're loyal to your pals leighton it appeared that leighton through a newspaper advertisement got into communication with the london firm of lawyers of which holmes was the confidential representative they had a theory that the girl they sought had gone to san francisco a runaway at the age of fifteen gertrude pendleton had been estranged from her father she had taken the downward path but the father relenting on his deathbed willed his estate to her and his executors had for months been endeavouring to locate her leighton immediately began his plotting to foist an impostor upon the executors and their lawyers it must be remembered that they had accepted him as a reputable lawyer he had made a secret trip to england and had secured a fairly complete record of the places the pendletons had lived in while the daughter was still with them originally residents of various parts of the british possessions the family had settled at applegate where the mother died the father following her some months later at applegate there were none who had ever known the daughter leighton's investigations in england failed to reveal any one who had in fact ever known her the pendletons only coming to england to settle down there a few years before to leighton's scheming brain the thing looked perfectly simple the murder plot was secondary it had been his original plan to find the real gertrude pendleton and if possible strike some bargain with her equipped with a picture of her taken at the age of fifteen he had finally traced her to find her respectably married consequently it was hardly likely that he could strike any combination with her that would give him the haul that he sought to make then with her alive there was always danger that she would disclose her identity to her husband when the child came along leighton keeping close tab on the peters concluded that inevitably motherly pride in the redeemed woman would bring about an attempt at a family reconciliation then would come to her the knowledge of her father's death and of her own inheritance he determined on one bold stroke kill mother and child on the gamble that what did happen would happen that the husband would be accused with the husband safely imprisoned or possibly executed his path with the impostor would be unimpeded he had coached his impostor well on the information gained on his english trip so much for leighton's story lanagan's story was startlingly simple after telephoning for me to cover fogarty's he had returned to watch the st germain 
fogarty finally came out and lanagan shadowed him to the mills building he came from there shortly in company with leighton and lanagan still in the grasp of his dead hand theory and knowing leighton by sight and his reputation in the inner circles for tangling up in estate cases dropped fogarty and followed leighton he went directly to the fairmont when he went to the desk to call for holmes lanagan was close at his side leighton did not know him by sight learning which room holmes had lanagan was fortunate in securing an unoccupied room adjoining and he was in his room ten minutes after leighton had entered holmes being fortunate enough to get the room merely hastened the climax because the case was already clearing in lanagan's mind his ear to the keyhole of the door connecting the two rooms many of the rooms in that hotel are so joined to permit of them being thrown into suites he had heard a fragment of conversation here and there and knew that leighton was bringing a girl for the englishman's examination who was being sought as a missing english heir finally the englishman shortly after eight o'clock had concluded to go with leighton to bring her desirous evidently of satisfying himself that she was in the tenderloin which seemed to be a point in their argument with holmes and leighton out of their room lanagan had set to work to whittle a hole in the door for better hearing facilities and then had sent the message to sampson that brought me to his room to lanagan's ranging mind the thing was as clear as print he had traced his connection past fogarty down to the last figure in the combination it was a long shot perhaps that leighton had put the real heir out of the way in order to impose an imposture on the estate and thus divide probably a full half but it was on long shots that lanagan's extraordinary brain usually won out the narratives were ended lanagan turned to leslie i want peters here chief to give the last note to my story to prevent any leak from the county jail i will have haddon get superior judge donlevy to telephone a verbal order of release to the jail for peters to be brought to the city to see his counsel it's rather unusual but that has been done before and donlevy will do it i think i'll get haddon in for the finals too he's been in the case pretty deep it was probably an hour later before haddon dropped into the room he had sent a machine for peters dunlevy telephoning the order a few minutes later peters in charge of a deputy sheriff entered and in brief and businesslike fashion the facts were laid before him it was a little too much for him to grasp all at once when he finally did it was the englishman who brought matters to a business basis by remarking leighton certainly seems to have been extremely positive about the identity of mrs peters did you know that she was gertrude pendleton sir said peters i married my wife as i found her and i asked no questions she made me a good wife she never talked about herself or her people did she have any keepsakes any old trinkets any pictures peters unbuttoned his shirt only this he said producing a locket attached to a fine gold chain she asked me to wear it when she was taken to bed and if anything happened to give it to the babe the police missed it in searching me it's her father and mother i think although she never said with eager fingers holmes opened the old-fashioned locket it is captain and mrs pendleton he said simply he looks as he looked the day before his death a silence fell upon the room as he snapped the locket and bowing profoundly passed it back to peters he then continued my mission here has certainly had a curious termination i will remain until the court matters against you are all disposed of i would suggest then that you return with me to london so that you can be on the ground in the arrangements for transferring the estate to you there will be no arrangements said peters i don't want the money the englishman stared incredulously don't want it don't want one hundred and fifty thousand pounds three quarters of a million dollars it will a sheet to the crown if you refuse it let it then said peters stubbornly i don't want it 
why should i take something my wife didn't want there must be something wrong about it somewhere why should i make money by the death of my wife and child if she were here to share it if only my boy were here he broke down for the first time since his arrest and sobbed throwing his arm over his head in a wild burst of grief finally he composed himself i'll go back to my trade he said simply hard work is the best thing for me now he turned to lanagan and their hands met in a long hard clasp if it can be done i'll turn the money over to you mr lanagan thanks peters no i've only done a newspaperman's work what the inquirer pays me to do you're all man and it's been a pleasure to clear you to leslie again the master newspaper mind calculating the minutes swiftly slipping around after midnight he snapped it's in your hands now chief keep everybody here and stall around for an hour or so while norton and i give the town a story that if it doesn't make a case in court against fogarty and bannerman will at least chase fogarty out of town till it blows over and beat bannerman out of the nomination for superior judge his name comes before the convention to-morrow night we're off then to me as he swiftly pelted out of the room key up to it norrie this is some stem winder end of story seven story eight of lanagan amateur detective by edward h hurlbut this librivox recording is in the public domain story eight at the end of the long night extra extra in shrill diminuendo awakened jack lanagan from the very heart of his morning slumber the morning paper man sleeps late and nothing short of cataclysm or the cry of an extra is likely to awaken him lanagan was from his bed to the window in a lanky leap hailing the newsboy it was the evening record with a screamer head and two hundred words of blackface type lanagan swept through it in a comprehensive flash with more speed than was his custom he thereupon dressed swanson he said gad what a story he sat on the edge of the bed more leisurely to roll a brown paper cigarette and read the story more carefully stripped of flaring headlines it was as follows all hope for the safety of captain robert swanson the retired millionaire shipping man who disappeared on wednesday evening was dissipated this morning shortly after nine thirty o'clock when the body of the well-known philanthropist was found in a sub-cellar room in the notorious palace hotel in chinatown death was due to strangulation life had probably been extinct three days and it is the police theory that captain swanson went directly to the hotel or was lured there on the evening of his disappearance his watch and valuables were found on his person so far as a hasty examination could discover no one saw him enter the hotel which bears an evil reputation and is occupied by the lowest type of denizen of chinatown and the barbary coast the room where the body was found is one of several that have been dug out beneath the basement and is used entirely by opium smokers chief of police leslie has ordered all available detectives on the case and arrests are expected at any moment which means finally grumbled lanagan that i get no day off to-morrow to split a quart of chianti with mine host pastori swanson he ran quickly back in his mind is president of the seamen's bank director of the cosmos club director of a dozen corporations trustee of his church sound as a nut at sixty-five solidly established in the old conservative families of knob hill with a family of married children likewise solidly established in the solidest kind of respectability and a wife who is a silvery-haired saint if there ever was one yet he a man who probably didn't know such a place as chinatown's palace hotel existed until that night is found dead in the lowest sink of that hole the extremes of the social system met in his end and the place of it the chinatown palace hotel of the days just before the fire gave that quarter of san francisco obliteration the one thing that could cleanse it 
was a sorry second to the pretentious hostelry on market street a ramshackle structure illy lit through its crooked corridors and musty rooms with ancient gas jets it looked more in its complete dirt and dinginess like an exaggerated rabbit warren three stories above ground and one or two below cut up into rooms the largest not more than eight by ten the smallest just large enough for a bunk and an opium layout it had survived by some miracle the health authorities to hive in musty murk the off-scourings of a city once when portsmouth square was the civic centre it had harboured the kings of the early gold days the rooms were larger in those days the front suites that gave ease to the idling new-made creases had long since been cut up into five six seven or eight as the increasing congestion of the quarter threw an increasing swarm of vermin to its recesses save for white dope fiends known in the vernacular of the police as hops cokes or morphs users of opium cocaine or morphine it was inhabited solely by chinese some of them coolie laborers but the most of them likewise fiends below the basement floor were a dozen rooms not high enough for a man to stand erect in the light of day never entered what light they received came from one main gas jet in the corridor or the occasional flash of a policeman's pocket light as the chinatown squad made their rounds save for the members of the squad and at times a jaded police reporter idling from the reporter's room in the nearby hall of justice on a quiet night through the district with the squad sergeant it is probable no white man save the fiends of the district had ever before gasped for breath in that foul den no white man that is before captain robert swanson who entered there one night never to emerge it was three days before one of the denizens of the sub-cellar finally realizing that the occupant of the next bunk was not in the stupor of drug but the stiffness of death made his way with frantic hippity hoppings to the first member of the squad he could find and reported the matter not forgetting to whine for his ten cents for so doing such in substance were the facts in the mystery that set the city and the coast uh, swanson was a notable figure in shipping circles in a ferment for a week for more than the initial fact of finding the body in chinatown's cesspool five days had now elapsed with not one single additional fact of consequence to clear the mystery suspects without number had been jailed every ex-convict fiend vagrant or questionable character of the district white yellow or black male or female had been put through the police mill the opium dens had been emptied of their wastrels blinking like bats in the light of day swanson's past and his present life were run under a high-power lens his servants and his employees lives and the lives of his former servants and former employees chief leslie was a fellow member of the cosmos club with swanson and if any additional good to his natural police pride were necessary to spur him on that afforded it every recourse that police experience could adapt or devise was applied always there was lacking motive that mainspring for crime that swanson had by any chance been addicted to the drug habit was early dismissed practically every hour of his methodical life could be accounted for for months back but in so far as his movements were concerned from the moment he left his doorstep on wednesday evening until the body was found he may as well have left his doorstep invested in an invisible mantle for no living person that could be located had seen him alive there was one peculiar circumstance he had worn that night a heavy ulster overcoat although the night had not been chilly and mrs swanson had remarked on it at parting the coat was not found with the body it is not exaggeration to say that in physical output lanagan worked harder than any three reporters or detectives during the first five days of the case he did not take me into his confidence he seldom did until the smash approached on any story 
he smoked eternally or chewed to pulp his own select brand of rank manilas or consumed innumerable cigarettes lanagan never had to bother with the daily routine of a story that was left to me his work was the big feature stuff he might not write a line for a week and then he would saunter into the picture with a new sensation that would upend the town but there seemed to be no upending on this case during the five days that had elapsed the big portion of the work had fallen to me lanagan had absolutely not turned a trick on wednesday evening at midnight as i turned in my story for the day identical as i felt it would be for the other two morning papers lanagan phoned me to meet him at the hall of justice i drifted down there i just wanted to tell you was his greeting that i am going to disappear don't look for me i will discover myself when the time comes i'm going to lose myself up in chinatown for the solution of that story is there and i'm not coming till i've landed something and choked off the side remarks of the times and herald outfit if i stay there for the balance of my natural life the police can hang as they please to their oary old dogma that a hophead never commits murder just because they're so positive i am going to take the other tack at least until i have proved their theory to my own satisfaction there isn't a man outside the frequenters of this quarter knew of that sub-cellar and that's the theory i am going to stick with now keep in pretty close touch with the offices so i can get you in a hurry if anything turns up good-bye in another moment he was walking rapidly up washington street to disappear down dupont out of sight for three days the story had run eight days and a dearth of fresh angles had thinned it out a trifle when on saturday evening along about ten o'clock as i hung around the local room hoping against hope for a call from lanagan it came meet me in front of old st mary's he said shortly and i thrilled instantly with that same premonitory tremor that always came over me when the climax was on i sped down kearney street and in the shadow of the church steps picked him up dorrit is watching me he said he's been covering me for days dorrit was the oldest special policeman in chinatown and generally held to be a leak for the herald through personal friendship for a former police reporter now city editor of that paper in such fashion do papers develop their sources of news i have one clue that may be the key to the solid brick wall we have been up against and i am not going to lose that key to the herald via dorrit concluded lanagan as he suddenly stepped fully into the glare of the gas street lamp on the corner just as dorrit sidled up i saw that lanagan had deliberately exposed himself really dorrit he remarked in that sinister tone he could assume so well on occasion some of these days i shall actually trip over you if you persist in blundering beneath my feet you might fall quite hard in that case and hurt yourself however just tell cartwright a city editor of the herald that i am going to hand him a package of nitroglycerin right on your own particular little bailiwick will you please run along now like a good little special policeman because we are going to lose you thusly he turned on his heel and ran for a california street car just lumbering past us up the hill and i followed suit after a few blocks he crossed through the car and dropped off on the other side scouting cautiously back toward chinatown by way of washington street drifting along with eyes wide for dorrit we finally made ross alley where lanagan stopped for a fraction of a second at the wicket of the gambling house at number eight at that time it was a strict rule of the gambling joints that a white man could not enter personally for all of my four years dubbing around on police i never had been able to enter a chinese gambling house when the play was on yet the lookout flashed one glance at lanagan grinned yellowly and ingenuously and the massive solid oak door before us swung noiselessly open and we passed quickly through as it shut behind us i heard a faint click click and glanced back 
three separate two by four scantlings heavily reinforced with iron had dropped back into their sockets the door was as solid as a concrete wall against the axes of the chinatown squad the theory being that by the time the squad had the door battered down the players had departed through some secret runway melodrama laughed lanagan at me but i had to come by the back door as it were i wouldn't like to have any stray police or reporters or dorrit suspect i was about to interview the man i am they might smell a rat possibly we are more isolated among these hundred chinks gambling their fool heads off than we would be in one of leslie's dark cells we passed directly through the long room with its eight high tables at each of which ten or a dozen impassive celestials with chopsticks beans and teacups stood engaged in the contraband pastime of fantan at a table or two a pie gal game was running and in a corner dominoes the air was so heavy and heated that i felt the perspiration starting in an instant the chinese gambler if he is winning sticks in that thick atmosphere for hours at a time at the rear of the room was another door likewise barred in triplicate here another lookout grinned friendly at lanagan and pressed on an innocent-looking nail-head in the wainscoting and the bars dropped and the door opened to a steep ladder we went down about ten feet into a blind areaway between two buildings it was as black as your derby hat but lanagan the marvellous stepped ahead with assurance and i followed him gropingly in another moment he rapped faintly on what i took to be a section of the brick base of the building a click sounded he took me by the arm pulled me after him another click and the next moment a blaze of electric light discovered us to be in a small lounging room elaborately appointed in oriental furnishings hello miss lanmigan the voice came from a corpulent twinkling-eyed richly garbed chinaman just arisen from a massive chair of ebony and mother-of-pearl hello foo said lanagan sinking into another massive chair and motioning me to do likewise my friend norton foo norton mr foo wong otherwise known to me as why because you will understand why because presently why because i tell you said fu wong chuckling him funny boy miss lamigan him what do you call em jolly me you like em smoke he pressed a button on the arm of his chair and a flowing garbed chinese boy appeared with rich havanas on a tray together with individual teacups and two-piece teapots for three did you find c wong lanagan asked abruptly while i studied fu whom i knew by reputation as one of the chinese merchant princes i am in a hurry fu i catch em he say charlie drive automobile charlie live there three or four weeks she cry one time see bring em tea oh charlie charlie why for you do him what's mala you charlie she stop quick see see why because see he don't know he say charlie he use em what you call em hop for the first time since this story broke that singular flashing almost like a cat's eyes flamed into lanagan's dark eyes and they shot a responsive shiver of high tension interest through me because i knew that at last he had struck the trail you have done more for me than i can ever repay said lanagan at parting you are a remarkable man fu wong fu laughed boyishly why because you saved my stole good name i help you as we went back out the way we came in lanagan enlightened me fu is president of the sui sing tong there is a chinaman swanson's cook si wong whom i have been hammering on for two days of all the household servants i have a vague suspicion of him i couldn't land him finally i looked up his affiliation found he was a sui sing man and then i enlisted the services of fu wong si wong would have to talk to his tong leader where the police or the reporters couldn't drag information out of him with a team of mules he purely and simply wouldn't sabe and that's all the satisfaction you could get 
why because is not only proprietor of one of the biggest bazaars here and a director of the chinese bank but he is also proprietor i am telling you chinatown secrets and not to be repeated of uh, the gambling house we came through and several others he is one of the powers of the quarter there was an english tourist robbed in his bazaar once of a couple of hundred dollars and i was sent up here Fu laboured under the impression that the entire sixteen pages of the inquirer were going to be turned over to that particular robbery. He felt the disgrace of the thing keenly, as any high-class Chinaman would, and personally offered the Englishman back the money. That was a good story. For some reason, Fu, not understanding the American newspaper idea of human interest, elected to think I had written a eulogy of him deliberately i could have had half his store at that time i guess if i had wanted it but i took a cigar and a cup of tea and ever since that time i have been taken inside the inner circle up here the room we were in is a runway through the basement of the bazaar next door in case of a raid charlie was a chauffeur named thorne employed by mrs swanson about three months ago for several weeks he was one of the numerous wastrels that that woman of unostentatious but magnificent charities had under her protection there are scores in and about the city men and women boys and girls that she had taken from the underside of life and put on top i didn't see him but some of leslie's men did and found nothing suspicious had they known he was a hop however they might have thought differently it establishes a very clear apparent connection between swanson and the palace hotel and the only definite clue that has been turned up we will save a lot of time by getting his address from leslie lanagan was through with leslie in a few moments he is going home but will be on tap with brady and wilson if we need him later he said he got curious when i mentioned thorne but promised to lay off until he heard from me thorne lives at lombard and larkin where in view of mrs swanson's undoubted suspicion that he committed the crime coupled with c wong's charge that he is a hop we will now proceed to call on him we were there in a few moments it was a squalid lodging house in charge of a slatternly beldame she didn't know whether thorne was in or not he was kind of loony lately she thought too bad said lanagan genially has charlie been so that he couldn't be out the last week he wasn't feeling well last time i saw him ain't seen much of him this week she replied i didn't know about it but i'm beginning to think he's one of them there fiends he is actin something awful sometimes lately what with his skippin and hoppin you can go on up the door was locked but it was a rickety affair and the lock yielded to the pressure of our shoulders a man who might have been any age from twenty to forty swung himself to a sitting position on a disordered bed and glared at us with eyes that were wide open but only half seeing pull a hop and i might as well jam him on a gamble said lanagan in an aside to me as he stepped quickly over and pulled thorne to his feet slapped him across the face and sat him down in a chair a high-pitched querulous protest was voiced at the treatment and then thorne whimpered oh you are so cruel what have i ever done to be treated so cruelly he began to cry done you snivelling viper put on your shoes and come with me to jail you murdered robert swanson and you are going to hang for it get up and come along again lanagan caught him a sharp slap across the face this time thorne did not whimper a look of cunning came into his eyes getting your wits back pretty quick now huh sneered lanagan thorne stared it seemed for a moment his clouded eyes entirely cleared and then the film of the drug-sodden brain fell over his eyes again and he relapsed to his hunched position he was shivering and rocking himself his angular knees drawn up to his chin clasped around with his arms oh dear oh dear his voice was pitched high again like a woman's why is everyone so cruel to me i'm very nervous as you can see gentlemen i really need something to quiet my nerves it is the doctor's orders really would it be acting too much now to ask for the loan of ten cents oh dear 
thorn said lanagan his aspect actually ferocious leaped before the half-arisen suppliant i shrank back myself his acting was so consummately done i'll give you ten cents you viper you murdering crawling poisonous viper i'll give you the condemned cell at san quentin and the death watch and the black cap and the quick drop until they crack that snake's head of yours into a dozen pieces that's what i'll give you chattering jabbering incoherently his long lean sharp-nailed claw-like hands working spasmodically before his face and toward lanagan the fiend huddled back he glanced from side to side his head lolling as though seeking some avenue of escape by a desperate leap lanagan's eyes were within a foot of his face thorne began to foam at the mouth i thought he was going into a fit as i watched fascinated the horrible scene bearing down upon the wretch with savagery in his voice and manner lanagan hammered on give you ten cents what do you want with ten cents you'll never get another shot of coke as long as you live thorne never in this world you are coming with me now coming where you will never need coke again coming to your death by hanging for murder not another shot in all this world will you ever get with a shriek that was more animals than man's thorne suddenly lunged forward quicker than the dart of a snake's head those hands with their long lean writhing fingers had twisted around lanagan's neck with a strength that was the strength of temporary insanity he flung lanagan from him and fell with him then like a lean gorilla he shook lanagan's head from side to side while he screeched fearful imprecations you lie you lie i'll get all i want that's what he said and i killed him and i'll kill you too yeah yeah he trailed away into a maniacal scream i hurled myself at him but the fiend for the moment at least had the strength of three men i finally managed to get in a blow that settled him lanagan rubbing his bruised neck ruefully rose slowly he was panting a little but chuckling score one for mental suggestion on a weak subject he laughed but i didn't figure those scrawny hands had quite that much strength this murder is clearer than print we all but reenacted the scene now my boy to establish the connection that would bring a man of swanson's position to a rendezvous at the palace to arouse the slumbering demon in this human orangutan it's rather a commentary on that hoary police doctrine that a dope fiend never commits murder i was right within thirty minutes chief leslie and brady and wilson his right-hand men were in the room and lanagan swiftly detailed the circumstances thorne had come too and was shaking and shivering as the drug wore out of his system leaving him nerve-racked he did not attempt to repudiate his utterance but sullenly admitted the murder in view of the words overheard by c wong there was but one person to clear up the mystery leslie lanagan and i hurried in the chief's machine to the swanson home nearly midnight as it was that they had had thorne once under examination and had permitted him to go was a source of bitter chagrin to the chief thorne showed none of the ravages of the habit that men of weaker physique exhibited the day the police picked him up he had happened to be comparatively normal and consequently he had passed safely through the quiz mrs swanson had not yet retired and upon learning that the chief was one of her late callers summoned us at once to the drawing-room she had one of those splendid faces seen occasionally in the aged where strength of mind or religious fervour has brought endurance of lifelong secret pain of body or soul the calmness of a noble resignation looked forth in a slight clouding of her clear eyes and expressed itself in the faint traces of suppression about her mobile lips the gleaming snow-white hair combed straight back from a forehead of a remarkable breadth in a woman invested her like an aureole she was a woman probably of sixty years you will appreciate gentlemen i trust she said in a low voice of refined modulation that i have endured much and am still suffering 
it is a very painful errand we are on mrs swanson and we will endeavour to be brief said lanagan in a voice that a chesterfield might have envied for courteous inflection and gentleness of expression but nevertheless it is an errand that must be performed he glanced at the chief who nodded speaking as a newspaper man continued lanagan it is my wish at all times to spare the feelings of those particularly women with whom i am brought into relation but the true newspaper man is a seeker after truth and he must follow as definite a path as the police follow there was an eloquent pause she gazed from one to the other during the interim as though striving to read their thoughts it was evident that the undercurrent that these skilled cross-examiners intended to convey had carried home well finally neither lanagan nor leslie spoke there was another pause she said at last you have some information to impart to me or some information to seek we desire to inform you said leslie slowly and with just a shade more of hardness in his tone as the detective began to work in him that we have under arrest the confessed murderer of your husband she leaned involuntarily forward in her chair and grasped the arm so hard that her knuckles showed white through the fair skin of her hands and we desire to inform you added lanagan quickly that the name of your husband's murderer is charles thorne and we desire to ask you what the motive was for the murder of your husband by charles thorne and why when you suspected that charles thorne was the murderer you did not immediately notify the police her hands slowly relaxed their grip on the chair arms as she sank back into its depths curiously in the way the light struck down at her hair and her face it seemed that the beautiful halo of white that had invested her and the delicate well-preserved whiteness of her skin turned suddenly to dirty grey if ever the blight of age settled visibly in fact or in fiction it settled upon her then you have charles thorne under arrest she said and her very tone was grey she did not deny the truth of the charge she did not express satisfaction that the murderer was found she merely asked whether they had charles thorne under arrest yes her eyes closed and her head dropped suddenly back against the chair we stepped swiftly forward but before we could take any measures to revive her her eyes had opened again the lips moved she was speaking but so gaspingly that we bent to hear it is the end of a long night she said with many halts the end of the long night a life's nightmare is done god have mercy on me she stopped completely then god pity all mothers who bear as i bore another long pause she was by strong effort retaining the clarity of her faculties under some heavy shock she repeated who bear as i bore the silence became acutely poignant it must be told she breathed finally you have asked me why i did not tell you my suspicions i will tell you now charles thorne her next words came so low that had it not been for the pregnant silence of the great drawing-room they would not have heard is my son i found i had been holding my breath and i glanced quickly at lanagan to see his breast falling with a deep exhalation my husband did not know she continued colourlessly charles thorne does not know i am his mother i have tried to live a full christian life i have given by tens of thousands to aid the erring i have thought to make all atonement and yet the blood of my blood slew the heart of my heart my dear husband one of god's noble men after that wrenching confession her normal poise began by degrees to return as the strength of an extraordinary mind began to assert itself the story was soon told 
of an alliance before her marriage to swanson of the boy taken by the father to be sent back to her after fifteen years the desolate father on his deathbed sent charles back to the mother for fifteen years since that day she had steadily stood sponsor for the boy to her husband he was but one of the many others of her objects of charity it may be said the boy inherited the dissolute traits of his father finally her own children by swanson all marrying that profound mysterious quality of motherhood prompted her to make one last effort to redeem the boy under her own eyes and she adopted the dangerous course for her of bringing him to the house as a chauffeur that he was given to drugs she did not know thorne had been caught in a series of petty thefts swanson had finally been compelled to discharge him he had left the house with maledictions upon swanson instinctively she had felt he was the author of the crime considering all of these circumstances and understanding the character of the fiend and his paternity it is evident that in his brain constantly weakening under drugs became fixed a sinister purpose to work out some scheme of revenge on swanson for driving him from a rich home and a cosy living with ample funds and opportunity for a secret indulgence in his weakness as it subsequently appeared thorne did not originally plan murder some abortive scheme of blackmail had but half formed in his crazy brain he lured swanson with a cunning letter full of explicit directions to the palace hotel by writing that he was seriously ill there he begged that mrs swanson be not informed until after swanson had seen him he wanted an opportunity to redeem himself he wrote and swanson as warm-hearted as his wife and not caring evidently to worry her needlessly about the condition of one of her charges until he had made an investigation set out on his errand of humanity never to return he wore his ulster obviously so that he would not be recognized going alone into the palace hotel in the sub-cellar he had met thorne there was a prolonged talk and swanson made the mistake of chiding the fiend on his habits desire coming upon him strongly thorne finally exhibited himself in all his ugly weakness and the spectacle was too much for the eyes of swanson unaccustomed to such sights he was stooping his way out of the little room after sternly refusing thorne's appeal for money when the long lean fingers of the half-insane man with some congenital strain outcropping perhaps of that vagabond dissolute father found an easy goal in a man already half suffocated in the thick air of the place alarmed when his fit had passed at what he had done and fearing to rob the body thorne had quakingly slipped into swanson's ulster and made his way in terror to his own room first he had journeyed to the foot of powell street weighted the coat with a rock and cast it into the water of the bay it was subsequently recovered and served as the single bit of incriminating evidence to substantiate his confession his letter to swanson in swanson's pocket he had taken with him to destroy by tearing into fine bits such were the salient features of a most extraordinary crime as ultimately established but to return to mrs swanson's drawing-room where lanagan is speaking charles thorne does not know then that you are his mother he does not know who does know no living person save myself and uh, you gentlemen in that case then mrs swanson said lanagan simply your secret will die with us she choked in attempting to speak and tears streaming from her eyes bade us each adieu for my part i confess i was blinking like a boy the outer doors closed behind us then back to the room for you chief snapped lanagan laconically throw thorne in at two fifteen charles thorne a former chauffeur murdered swanson after attempted blackmail failed you stand of course chief stand jack replied that sterling officer it's in so deep it can only come out when the last drop leaves my veins i knew that said lanagan 
now norrie sharply get together we have exactly fifty-five minutes to press time end of story eight